I will start by uh, asking every everyone everybody welcome to this lecture. And I should ask you, did you notice that two days ago, Monday, it was World Water Day? Did you celebrate in Nukos? <laughs> no. We World Water Day, you know? Yeah. So that's uh, something. Today we will listen to Lars Hillander. It's a friend and colleague since long time. He's an associate professor in hydrology. Uh, he has a long research experience when it comes to uh, environmental science. He has also a very large international experience and spent time in South America, Brazil, uh, in Africa, Mozambique in particular. He has been in Asia, especially in Japan, and uh, also uh, um, has specialized in pollution of in water of, for example, uh, mercury and other pollutants. Uh, he is also a farmer and he has his own farm, which I visited um, uh, and also worked very much to make this um, sustainable. So he is really into the right track. Nowadays, he's more concerned with sanitation and recycling of resources. So that might be enough for introduction of Lars Hillander. So please, uh, the floor is yours. Okay. Many thanks. Uh, yeah. May I maybe uh, shortly mention that uh, at the farm we are about to, we have put up solar cells to get electricity from the sun. And now we are planning a project where we will produce uh, ammonia, uh, liquid ammonia, which is an important fertilizer in agriculture. And this is a way to store the excess energy from the summer months in Sweden to use the uh, energy in the winter as ammonia and feed it into fuel cells to get electricity for the house, for the cooking, for the heat pump. So we can uh, uh, get uh, the uh, houses warm during the winter time. Otherwise we are dying in Sweden in the winter time when it's <laughs> maybe minus 20 or 30 degrees in my area. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll uh, start with a presentation here now and uh, hope you can see it. Okay, there we are. so uh, I will talk about uh, water use and management, agriculture and sanitation. And everybody can hear now? We hear you. Is everybody here? Yeah, yeah, we can. Okay. Uh, and uh, this is uh, my intended disposition. I will talk very basic about cultivation and then uh, present the basics for sanitation and basics for irrigation. And finally, a uh, few conclusions at the end. And uh, as humans, we uh, need to be able to uh, have fresh air with oxygen for breathing and for the cell breathing and so on cell respiration, we need sugar and other energy sources, we need water and nutrients, and uh, we need the space, sanitation, and uh, basic uh, uh, chemical process here is the uh, respiration of the cells. We get, uh, with, they use sugar and uh, use oxygen, which we take in via the lungs. And uh, then we uh, 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 transform or the, the cells will uh, process it to get energy in uh, for muscle work. And uh, then uh, we emit carbon dioxide and water being uh, the rest products from the respiration. And uh, a basic point I would like to uh, 
put your attention to is that energy cannot be destroyed, but it can be transformed between different forms. For example, electrical energy, we can put it, we can get light, we can get heat and so on, but we cannot destroy the energy. It will just get another form. For example, the energy in sugar can be transformed to muscle work, but it's not getting destroyed. And uh, the human processes resembles the needs of plants. The plants, which we are maybe not thinking about so much, but they are also respiring. And during night time, they are, uses, uh, they, they are using energy because it's dark, so they cannot produce oxygen and uh, have the pro photo process, photosynthesis process running. But in sunshine, they produce new energy. All green plants produce new energy storages, such as sugar, starch, different sorts of proteins in uh, peas, beans, or whatever. And they do this via photosynthesis. And photosynthesis is uh, basically uh, based on the carbon dioxide and water. And the energy input is coming from sunlight. It's the chlorophyll which can catch, capture the sunlight and uh, process the uh, carbon dioxide and water over to sugar. And we get oxygen as a rest product. And uh, that's why we have oxygen in the air. In fact, it's when we get plants, got plants on the earth, then the oxygen level in the atmosphere increased. And uh, there's a very uh, cute song on uh, this uh, YouTube uh, uh, address, which you can listen to after the presentation, because I'm not sure how to uh, get it in <laughs> my presentation. No one. It's, uh, it's self-explanatory, uh, so you can have a look at it after the presentation. And the basics for growing, it's that we want this photosynthesis to be as efficient as possible. And for this, we need very much of nutrients such as nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. And we need much of water, very much water. We also need the carbon dioxide. But this is uh, accessed freely from the air, so to say, because we have uh, too much carbon dioxide in the air, as you know. That's why we are talking about the climate crisis and what to do uh, to pr combat these high carbon dioxide levels in the air. And for example, we get carbon dioxide when we burn fossil fuels. And that's the reason why we have so high, we have too high carbon dioxide levels in the air. And fossil fuels, you know, it's uh, coal, petrol and so on. So what is nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium? Yeah, it, it's uh, elements. You, I think you are very familiar with this uh, periodic table. And you see that uh, element number seven and 15, it's nitrogen and phosphorus. They are close to each other in the table. They have uh, many similarities and they are also found in uh, human life and in the plants, in, uh, often in the same, uh, uh, same uh, uh, components such as in uh, the uh, DNA, RNA, which are sort of coding our uh, uh, coding our genome over uh, uh, how, how we are, what we will become, in fact, uh, and uh, our uh, uh, individualities and uh, 
capacity and uh, so on, length and uh, everything uh, about uh, heritage and so on. And uh, we have uh, phosphorus also in the uh, energy transfer process, adenine triphosphate and adenine diphosphate, which are uh, processing the uh, how to uh, move the mast cells and so on. And uh, we have uh, phospholipids to, uh, in the membranes and uh, we also have, uh, contrary to the uh, plants, we, or in addition to the plants, I should say, we also have uh, phosphorus in the teeth and bones, building up the uh, skeleton and uh, the teeth to chew and so on. Nitrogen, we uh, have uh, very much in the air, about four fifths of uh, the air is nitrogen. And we also have it in uh, the uh, codes for the uh, DNA and RNA. We have it in amino acids, such in uh, building up the proteins, which we have in beans, peas, milk, muscles, and so on. So we, if we continue with the potassium, the uh, element number 19, it's very different in different area of the periodic table, but it's close to sodium. So it has many similarities with sodium, ordinary cooking salt. And uh, potassium we have in liquids. It's an electrolyte for balancing the, uh, the, the, the um, uh, content, the, uh, the uh, salt content of the cells and so on for getting proper function of the membranes, the muscles, the nerves, and so on. And uh, loose, except for nitrogen, which we have in pure form in nature. Phosphorus is uh, never in elemental form in uh, nature. Uh, potassium, is it, if it's very dry areas, it could be as potassium chloride, for example, which is mined for uh, fertilizers. But uh, otherwise, uh, generally we have uh, potassium dissolved in water and uh, in the uh, plant, uh, plant uh, humid, the plant, um, uh, Cell, the, the cell liquids, cellular liquids. So, uh, because uh, NPK are so important for plant growing, we they are widely used in fertilizers. In addition to this, nitrogen is also used in explosives. Maybe. Uh, Reckon, did you remember the explosion in Beirut in August last year? It was uh, a fertilizer, uh, ammonium nitrate, which exploded in the uh, harbor there. And it's the uh, same uh, chemical composition as in dynamite, which the scientist Nobel invented the last century and uh, is widely used all over the world. Uh, regarding phosphorus, it's uh, except for in fertilizers, we also use it in detergents, in pesticides, very many uh, toxic pesticides contain phosphorus and uh, it has even been used in uh, wars and so on for killing a lot of people. We have it in Coca-Cola, which may be a bit surprising to some of you, but it's because Coca-Cola is based on phosphoric acid and uh, it's uh, certainly a high content of phosphorus in phosphoric acid. Then we continue with potassium, which is uh, 
except for fertilizers, also used in soaps. Potash, maybe you uh, are familiar with, uh, form a way to produce a sort of uh, soap. We have it in salts, often used in industry for as potassium hydroxide. We have it in match heads for uh, lighting the uh, matches. There's uh, a potassium compound on the head there, which is uh, normally red or black. So we, in fact, we have a perfect fertilizer everywhere. We are trying to get it out from the body every day in the form of urine. And it contains uh, all the three important macronutrients, potassium, uh, or the nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, and potassium. And in addition, it also contains a lot of micronutrients, which the plants need, but in very small amounts. So often people are not uh, talking so much about them, but they are important. If they don't get it, they get sick. They cannot, uh, the plant cannot grow, cannot produce, for example, chlorophyll if it gets too little of uh, manganese. And uh, same with copper, if it's getting too little of uh, copper, then uh, the, we get white uh, lines on the leaves without chlorophyll and the top get yellow. Yeah, it, may, this maybe I should explain. It's uh, from an uh, agricultural uh, experiment in the uh, Philippines, where they are comparing uh, urine with other fertilizers in combination with charcoal. And uh, nutrient recycling without any poisons is possible in a very profitable way by using gold water, that is urine, for plants. And what you should be careful with, it's to not uh, spray it directly on the green leaves before you have diluted it 10 times with water. Otherwise it's getting too strong. The leaves will be burnt. But it's uh, Sometimes that the soil is uh, too bad for cultivation. In uh, sandy soils, for example, uh, water-soluble nutrients like uh, potassium, such as potassium, will be leached away when raining. And uh, this can be counteracted by adding charcoal. It's called biochar when you put the charcoal into the soil. And this is called soil improvement. You are improving the soil so it will fit better for the plants to get higher yields and keep the nutrients in the soil, make the nutrients available to the plants so they are not uh, running away when it's raining. In fact, the uh, main problem in uh, your area, I think it's not that the nutrients are running away when it's raining. It's that they are accumulating together with the uh, elements which are not good for the plants. So it's getting too high salt concentration in the soil. I will come back to that later on. So the uh, important thing to know about uh, charcoal, that it is, it is that it's very persistent against degradation. If you have a, a apple, for example, and you throw it in the soil, you will not find it in, uh, within a few weeks or definitely, definitely no part of it at all after one or two years because it has been degraded. But if you put uh, charcoal into the soil, you can find it here for thousands of years. And uh, this has two important uh, implications. One is that you can use charcoal as a carbon sink. You can uh, get uh, 
carbon, capture carbon from the atmosphere via the plants. You can char it and you add the char coal into the soil and then it will stay there for a thousand years or even longer. And then you, this is one way to reduce the carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. Maybe the only economically feasible way we have for the moment. Another aspect is that if you add the charcoal to the soil, then it will stay there for a very long time. You, have, you will have use of it for a very long time. We'll get benefit from it for a very long time. And uh, if you look at the next picture, we see how the plant roots and the mesel, the uh, fungus, uh, they produce a mesel similar to roots which are growing all around in the soil. And uh, they uh, are entering the uh, charcoal pieces and uh, make sort of a web around them, inside them, and so on. And the reason for this is that the charcoal, they have uh, lots of pores which are filled with water and nutrients. And the micelle and the roots want those uh, uh, nutrients and the water, of course. So in this way, the charcoal are retaining the nutrients in the soil. And uh, this is practiced widely in the rainforests by the Indians in the Amazon rainforest. And uh, they uh, made a, 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 a sort of term for this, which is called terra preta. Terra preta, it's Portuguese, and the, the uh, meaning is black soil. And as you know, the uh, charcoal is black. So it's uh, very natural that it's uh, getting black soil when you add it to the soil. So I, I said that it's very porous, the charcoal pieces. And uh, here you see a scanning electron micrograph of a pine charcoal. And uh, it's uh, very similar to a honeycomb. You know, the bee, uh, producing uh, combs made of wax, and they fill uh, the combs with honey. And uh, the honeycomb, of course, is much larger than the uh, uh, pores in the charcoal, but it's the same uh, function, same uh, idea that you put something good into this uh, pores in the charcoal you put water and uh, nutrients into them, and then the uh, roots can acquire these uh, nutrients and the water for growing. And the reason that you have uh, those uh, poles, it's uh, that the plants have very strong cell walls. As I said earlier, we have uh, the bones, the skelet, which are bearing up our uh, body and our organs and so on. But the plants, it's a sort of contrary. You, inside of having a skelet inside the body, you have uh, walls outside, the cell walls, which are bearing up the structure of the uh, cells. And uh, this is very persistent. So when you uh, pyrolyze the uh, organic matter, the cell walls will uh, be, be, stay uh, behind. They will uh, be left, but the inside of the cells will uh, get uh, evaporated and will uh, leave the uh, fire, uh, so to say, the uh, pyrolysis uh, uh, process as gases, syn, syn gas. We call it. It's carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, hydrogen, and uh, different carbon hydro uh, CH uh, compounds, carbon uh, methane, ethane, and those uh, 
for, for uh, lose the carbon gases. And uh, biochar is staying in the soil for a long time, as I said, and uh, the bacteria love it because of the uh, nutrients and the water. So if you uh, put the biochar or the charcoal into a compost, the bacteria there will uh, keep the uh, nitrogen which is uh, emitted from uh, plants when they are getting degraded in uh, the compost. And uh, then the, uh, if you don't have a, a charcoal there, the uh, nitrogen the gases will go up into the air. But if you have a charcoal, the bacteria will capture some of the nitrogen gases and you get a richer compost with more nutrients left in it. Uh, okay. Uh, I think I'll continue over to uh, sanitation. Uh, the best uh, toilet we can have, it's uh, dry toilets. And uh, firstly, they recover 99% of all plant nutrients. All of those nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, micronutrients, everything, it's uh, left in the toilet instead of being flushed away with the wastewater. Still, there may be some problems with the dry toilets. One is that they may uh, smell, uh, especially of ammonia and uh, nitrogen gases may be leaving. So if we uh, improve the uh, dry toilets by separating the urine from the, uh, the feces, the uh, hard stuff, so to say, we uh, get uh, less odors and uh, less uh, emissions of uh, nitrogen. Nitrogen we want to keep because it's so important for the plant production. And uh, charcoal may uh, uh, improve also the uh, removal of the odors and uh, reduce the nitrogen emissions as I said earlier, in the compost. So uh, this may be, uh, I need to explain the blue one. It's the, uh, in the left part, we have the, uh, uh, the drainage for the urine. And in the right part, we have the uh, feces, the hard stuff in uh, leaving uh, the body when we go on toilet. So the urine is collected in a plastic tin, for example, and uh, then we uh, put it in the garden straight away as fertilizer. But the, uh, because uh, normally it's uh, fairly clean. You shouldn't put it on the leaves and uh, so on, but it's, uh, it's no problem with the, uh, contamination or uh, so, so sort of uh, dangerous bacteria and so on, generally. If it's problem with bacteria, then you store the urine for a, a certain time, maybe a, a month or uh, if it's warm, even a shorter time. And then the high pH in the urine will cause that all germs, uh, bacteria, all, uh, all the uh, microorganisms causing diseases will die. But the feces, the, uh, the part in the uh, right uh, hand, the dark, dark uh, uh, stuff in this uh, picture, it's... Uh, more difficult. It contains lots of uh, uh, contaminants and uh, disease-causing uh, stuff. 
bacteria and so on, virus, whatever. So this we need to compost at a uh, high temperature, in, uh, not too high, but at least uh, more than uh, 50 degrees or something like that, 60, 70, so that they uh, are getting killed. And then this uh, uh, composted feces are excellent as fertilizers. How to separate the urine? On the left hand, you see uh, our uh, kid when he's using the urinal we put at uh, home. And uh, we have a 20 liters uh, plastic container below here. And when you go to the toilet after you have urinated, you add one deciliter of water to clean it and so on, so you don't get uh, smells. And uh, it's uh, uh, functioning very well, in fact. Then we use it in uh, our garden uh, cultivations and also in the uh, uh, flower, uh, the, the pots, pot, pot plants in the uh, windows and so on. And the problem is certainly for women, it's uh, you have special equipment which makes that you can uh, 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 use also a urinal and you see uh, how a portable urinal for women looks like here and uh, it's uh, popular in some countries not uh, mainly because it's uh, sometimes the public toilets are not so well clean so then uh, some women they uh, prefer to carry the urinal with them and when they go to the toilet, they use this instead of sitting down on the toilet. There are different brands of composting toilets. And uh, the, uh, I, I don't think it's any big difference. In fact, it's the uh, important thing is that they are not using uh, water don't add, add water for transporting away the uh, feces and the urine. And uh, that's the important thing when you talk about uh, how to recirculate the uh, nutrients from our body, that you are not adding uh, other things like water or in uh, industry you have a lot of uh, toxics, uh, chemical compounds and so on, which uh, are getting added into the wastewater system and uh, then make it uh, impossible often to use it as fertilizer in a safe way. If uh, you uh, cannot uh, accept to have uh, uh, dry toilets, at least it's possible to have a vacuum toilet. We, a vacuum toilet with a separate tank is much better than a water closet, the ordinary toilet. And this is because uh, you don't get uh, wastewater from industries and uh, from uh, uh, other places like hospitals and uh, so on, where uh, toxic components may enter and uh, then it's easy to uh, recycle the nutrients back into uh, agriculture and plant production. Agriculture, forestry, plant production in the home garden or in uh, public garden and so on. Uh, yeah, uh, I don't know. When should we take the break? Uh, what do you say, Lars? Well, it's up to you. Uh, now, you, you are supposed to do half of it before the break and the second half after the break. Oh. So it's uh, I think I have done more or less uh, half of it. And uh, uh, we could uh, go over to... Uh, oh, okay, we, we take two uh, slides more. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> Uh, so the, the idea of using a dry toilet system, the uh, 
positive aspects is that it's uh, hindering spreading of infections from the toilet waste. And it's drastically reducing the water consumption because you don't use water for flushing. There's uh, no smell if it's uh, well ventilated or correctly ventilated. It's uh, not much work if you have those big containers, which uh, it's, it's enough to empty them every 20th year if the container is big enough. And uh, the, uh, uh, maybe some people cannot bear uh, to do this uh, work uh, with emptying them, but uh, then you can uh, employ people to do it. You're employing people uh, nowadays to take care about your faces in the wastewater treatment plant. So why shouldn't it be able to uh, employ them for uh, emptying these containers? And uh, it, uh, uh, it, it, it's a sort of uh, good work for uh, do these, those who can bear the uh, smell maybe. And uh, smell, you can use uh, respiration masks nowadays most people have respiration masks in one way to protect from COVID-19. And uh, you could uh, use uh, better respiration masks, taking away uh, the uh, odors from the uh, uh, waste. And this you can do with uh, active carbon. So now you see we are back on this uh, uh, thing about biochar the uh, charcoal, which is uh, the uh, active uh, substance in uh, masks with uh, active carbon. And I think you have used it in laboratory uh, experiments also in uh, the university. Another good aspect, very important for many countries is that it hinders eutrophication. The, this eutrophication means that uh, the uh, uh, nutrients coming out into the rivers and uh, uh, seas, lakes, they are triggering the uh, growth of uh, aquatic plants, and uh, which uh, so they are getting uh, uh, more than natural abundance. They are taking up the uh, oxygen from the uh, water, the fish are dying, and so on. So if you use a dry toilet system, then there's no uh, wastewater which you uh, put into the uh, uh, rivers and uh, lakes. So then you don't get any eutrophication. So this is a very important aspect when talking about uh, sustainability you should be able to use the nutrients in a sustainable way, not wasting it by sending it out into the lakes where it's damaging the uh, fresh water. Uh, another aspect is that it produces fertilizers to sustainable agriculture. It's not sustainable if you apply lots of nutrients, fertilizers in the fields and uh, then you are producing, uh, you are sending the uh, products, the wheat or cotton or whatever it is, for using it for consumption and uh, the, then uh, yeah, but both of food consumption and also of uh, uh, clothes and so on. And uh, then you uh, need to take care about the byproducts there. From the uh, wheat, you get uh, uh, feces and uh, urine and so on in the toilets, which you should use as fertilizers. And from the cotton production, you get uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, waste also, which you could use for producing biochar, for example, to improve the soil fertility. And uh, very important uh, 
aspect is also that dry toilets, they do not damage our important provision, maybe most important. We can uh, survive for certain weeks without food, but not without drinking water. We need it daily. Okay, and perhaps that's enough uh, for now. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, so uh, uh, then, uh, then I should go to, to the uh, last. Uh, I have put uh, some questions for the discussion mm -hmm. here. Yeah. Okay. So could you uh, discuss uh, those during uh, the break? Uh, humans can get COVID-19. But can plants get COVID-19? And can they get any other disease? Discuss similarities, differences. And the second question is how to use water from the RLC for plant production? Can reverse osmosis be of help? I know this last question is before I present the uh, irrigation section, but uh, it's... Uh, more on a general aspect here and reverse osmosis maybe you have heard about as an uh, option to get uh, fresh water from salt water. So that then we'll meet again after uh, 20 minutes and uh, we'll uh, listen to your answer to the questions. Mm -hmm. So uh, instead of using the water closet you could use the one with a separate bowl in the front for the urine. And uh, then the urine is collected there from uh, both men and women and go, is led down to a separate tank. And by this uh, sort of uh, simple solution, you can collect 60% of the phosphorus, 80% of the nitrogen and 90% of the potassium. And uh, so it's, easy way to get, uh, collect most of the nutrients without uh, heavily uh, expanding the investment for the wastewater system. So if you are using a water closet, the wastewater needs to be cleaned. And this can be done in a filter on a local scale. And here uh, chopped wood has shown to be a very uh, uh, promising uh, material for using in uh, wastewater filters. And uh, it can be uh, done like this. In this case, it's uh, filled in a hole. Uh, we have done it in a, uh, on a, mounted it uh, on the top of the surface where we build up a small hill of a chopped wood and uh, then we are cleaning the wastewater there. So you start with the bottom layer of chopped wood. You uh, do something, you can use plastic tubes, but uh, this uh, farmer, he prefer to use uh, log, so uh, it can be totally degradable. And uh, on the uh, logs, you put a roof, and you, uh, th then you fill the chopped uh, wood on top of the roof. You see on the left side, you see part of the roof over the logs. And then the wastewater is let in there below the uh, chopped wood. And uh, then uh, we should see if it's getting clean. We, here we see the incoming uh, water has a uh, high content of nitrogen and phosphorus. And uh, when we sampled this in uh, three years ago, it, uh, the uh, nitrogen content was uh, 3.4 milligram per liter, and the limit by, set by the authorities is 15. And the uh, phosphorus content was 0 0.3, and the limit is uh, uh, 1.3. And the uh, degradable, biodegradable, uh, biological oxygen demand at uh, seven days incubation was 5.9. And also this was uh, uh, clearly below the limit. And the uh, bacteria, the uh, coolie bacteria was uh, also below the limit value. 
So it's, uh, it's worked at that site with the, that wastewater. So uh, biochar and nutrient cycling of toilet waste, uh, will, uh, will it benefit the RLC region? What do you think? Something you can have as a question for the future discussions at the uh, with your university colleagues. Uh, very short demonstration how to make biochar in a small scale. And uh, if you fill a tin with firewood, organic waste, etc., you should punch a hole in the bottom of the tin. Uh, this is because if you don't have a hole there to let out excess gases, the tin will explode. And uh, after 15 minutes, uh, the fire looked like that. And uh, the pyrolyzed gases are pressed out through the hole and they get ignited straight away, contribute to the heat in the room in this case. And when it's cooled down, you take away the lid and you have biochar inside the tin because oxygen didn't enter. If you make the hole on top of the lid, then oxygen uh, will enter there and everything will burn up. So you have to have the, uh, but the uh, hole in the bottom of the lid, lower part, and then the pressure inside there will press out the pyrolyzed gases, but not permit oxygen to enter. And then uh, when you have this uh, biochar charcoal, you can use it in your uh, pots for flowers or in the home garden or whatever. On a large scale, you can certainly uh, build it for using biochar for the farms. So over to irrigation. This is maybe the way you are accustomed to uh, uh, see irrig irrigation systems in the RLC region. Large channels with water flowing, you need very much water. Maybe uh, you can uh, economize uh, a little on the water supply by using uh, the system you see in the lower part of the picture, the, the lower uh, picture, where you have uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, tubes which you uh, take, uh, uh, let water in from the higher, uh, from a river or channel uh, flowing at a higher level and then you have, uh, uh, by gravity, you let the water over into separate channels. You don't need to flood all field. You can uh, let the water into channels where it's dry and you need water for the moment. So it's different, uh, there's a lot of different irrigation techniques. Uh, one is uh, those uh, ditch furrows or canals, whatever you want to call it, as you saw in the earlier picture. And uh, the uh, good aspect of those are that it's very low investment costs. The negative aspect is that it's very inefficient use of water. Then you have sprayers of varying dimensions, all from uh, garden uh, sprayers and uh, on the lawns and uh, golf courses and so on, up to very large uh, sprayers used in uh, Saudi Arabia, for example, for irrigating the uh, desert areas and so on for getting wheat production or whatever. And this is very high investment costs. And it's also inefficient use of water, and especially when it's windy and sunny. So it's a better option is to use drip irrigation. As you see uh, an example of on the picture in the lower right corner. And uh, it's very low to medium investment costs. It's a much more efficient use of water. 
negative aspect is that it's more complex management. And you can uh, do this uh, even simpler by just uh, punching holes in the plastic tubes put out in the fields. Then uh, there may be problem with that the hole is uh, getting uh, logged, uh, getting uh, the water cannot pass because of salt uh, crystallization and so on. And then the management uh, time for managing the water in irrigation system increases. How to reduce water use at irrigation? Uh, the main uh, important thing is that uh, you should reduce the evaporation. So you never irrigate when it's windy or sunny, if you could avoid it. Or, and if you have a limited water supply. You could use plastic films, mulching and so on, put uh, straw or uh, leaves or whatever on top of the soil. So you uh, reduce the uh, evaporation and uh, use it as an evaporation barrier. It's a very interesting alternative in the Negev desert, where they had two uh, uh, layers of plastic film, one on top of the soil, and then they had uh, made a hole uh, for the uh, cucumber plants and the pumpkins they planted, and this plastic layer made that uh, very little water was evaporating from the soil. And then uh, to reduce uh, the uh, 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 the the uh, uh, rate of uh, evaporation from the plant itself, they had put a small uh, sort of a greenhouse, like plastic tunnels. I'm sure you have seen it in RLC region also. So uh, th then you get uh, less uh, evaporation from the plants and uh, you uh, are economizing the use of uh, the water very much. Uh, this, uh, however, creates proper service and management of the equipment. Another alternative is uh, to uh, create shadow and wind barriers. For example, uh, by planting trees, if you have a possibility to do this, it's maybe uh, too little water even for this in uh, your area. When you uh, reduce the water use, there are some uh, aspects you need to be very, uh, pay special attention to. And one key factor is that it's necessary to apply more water than the plants need. Otherwise, uh, the, uh, there will be uh, too high salt content in the soil. And uh, normally, uh, in many areas, that's not a problem because it's uh, so uh, raining so much during the winter time in Sweden, for example. So uh, all soils will uh, run away. We can even irrigate with the uh, Baltic Sea water in some areas for some uh, plants because in the winter it will rain so much. So the uh, salts, excess salts, will be washed away from the soil. But in areas, in arid areas, <coughs> sorry, in arid areas where there's a lack of uh, water and uh, there are uh, no uh, seasonal uh, floods of uh, rain, then uh, you must be very careful to uh, apply more water than the plants are needed so that uh, you don't get uh, increasing soil content in the soil because the excess water will leach away the soils. Uh, using water from irrigation, uh, wastewater for irrigation may be an option, but then you must be very observant to pollutants and also to the high soil content, which uh, will burn green leaves if you apply it on, uh, on the growing plants. So this is uh, the uh, comments I have regarding uh, irrigation. 
And uh, in conclusion, I would uh, like to state that photosynthesis is the base for human life and nature cannot be manipulated behind natural limits. So we have to, uh, we have a need to prioritize sustainability to uh, get maximal or optimal use of the sources we have on the planet. And therefore we need to go for resource conserving technologies and we should go for robust systems minimizing the need of rare or not available experts, expensive spares and so on. I was working in uh, Mozambique in Africa for a couple of years and there were very many factors there standing because there were no experts, there were no spares for running them. And this was a big, big uh, uh, negative aspects for the living conditions in the country. So with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and maybe you have more questions.